Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Moving on to the fourth presentation of today, our speaker for this session is Mike Balambi, founder of Passage Maker Group. The pre presentation topic is Sourcing 2017 Best Practices and Common Mistake. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. It's a, I'll stand down here and make it a little more casual, and hopefully it'll be interactive today. Is the microphone working? OK. Um, first off, we've got a lot to fit into just like 35 minutes, so I'll jump right into it. Um, I'll get my timer over here. By any chance, did anyone attend the Global Sources Summit over the past few days? Anybody attended that? I, I gave a few presentations there, and I wanted to make sure there's not overlap. So I'll adjust today's presentation based on your interests. You know, everybody's worried about price and quality, but how many people in the audience are worried about intellectual property, that your business secrets or that your ideas might be knocked off? Anybody worried about that? OK. And everybody has uh, serious concerns about quality control and pricing, I assume. So it should be a, a good fit. Um, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about, uh, well, first off, you know, don't worry about uh, taking down notes. Um, you know, feel free to take pictures. If you leave your business card with me or at the door, I'll send you the PowerPoints. I'll send you the video recording that I made of a similar presentation a couple days ago. So don't stress out about taking notes and stuff. But feel free to take pictures, do whatever you like. Um, also, if I do a good job, please ask some questions at the end, because then the organizers will see that I engage the audience, and they might be, invite me back next, next year. So I'd love to come back to Hong Kong. Um, I start off all my presentations with uh, the don't hope rule. Meaning that, is, is the microphone working? I, it's hard to, it's, it's working okay? All right, it, I'm getting feedback, sorry. Um, the don't hope rule, sorry about that. Okay, thanks a lot. The, the don't hope rule is that after attending this seminar or you're at this trade show and you're going back to your headquarters, you're on a flight across the Pacific and you ask yourself, I hope that that supplier understands my specifications. I hope that the supplier that I chose isn't going to knock me, knock me off. I hope that they understand the delivery times. If you have to hope, in China game, you've already lost. So my point is that it is possible to develop a system so that you don't have to hope. You can say, I know that the supplier understands my specs. I know that I've got great protection of my intellectual property. I know that they're going to deliver on time at the agreed price, but it's not easy. It is possible. So nothing's easy, but everything's possible. Why am I up here? Why you should listen to me? Well, first off, I'm not going to give you a sales presentation. I hate it when I go to a conference and the person stands up there telling them how great they are and why you should pay them money. You know, I, I've made lots of mistakes. I don't claim to be an expert. I'm just here to share with you my challenges and uh, some of the mistakes that I made in hopes that you don't make the same mistake. Um, as a bit of a background, you can tell from the accent, I'm from the US. I came to Asia in 1993 as an exchange student, thought I'd be here for a couple semesters. Um, a wife, two children, 200 employees later, I'm still here. So, um, and I knew a lot less about China sourcing when I started my company, Passage Maker, 20 years ago than you will know when you leave the room today. So anything is possible. What does Passage Maker do? Simply put, our customers are large enough that they could probably set up their own factories in China, set up their own sourcing teams on the ground but they don't want the headache of building teams and managing teams and dealing with local taxation and Chinese government and corruption issues. So we provide a virtual sourcing office and a virtual factory. We actually set up assembly lines underneath our existing factory, which I own 100%, no local partners, um, to deal, deal with virtual factories. One of the reasons is to control intellectual property. You've got a great idea, but you don't want the suppliers to know how the pieces are coming together, or you don't want the supplier to know that you're putting it into a, a box and selling it to Walmart for 90 cents, whatever. If you want to keep information close to your chest, know that there are companies like Passage Maker that provide black box assembly and virtual factories. OK, that's all the sales pitch you're going to hear from me about Passage Maker. About eight years ago, I wrote a book called The Essential Reference Guide to China Sourcing, which is basically the operation manual for Passage Maker. And uh, to my surprise, I started getting calls from like the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and CNN because now I'm a published author <laughs> and uh, just putting the book on Amazon. And you know, it, it uh, sell, sold OK and paid for my villa in Thailand. So that, that was pretty cool. And after I realized that this book had some traction, 
Um, Professor Neil O'Connor, I'm not sure if he's here, but Neil and I put together the China Sourcing Academy, which is an extension of the book. There's like 30 hours of online courses if you want to learn about, you know, what should a contract look like, how to negotiate with a supplier. But don't worry, you don't have to pay for the Academy. I'm going to give a lot of this stuff for free today. But if you want more, check out the Academy. And then these are some of the other businesses that I'm associated with. Um, our venture capital is at AmAsia, and we've invested in an inspection company called Asia Quality Focus. We sold that a few years ago. And we also have a legal services division called Asia Bridge Law. So not only have I owned factories in China, not only do I deal with suppliers every day for the last 20 years, but I've been a part owner in an inspection business doing quality control and legal services. So I'm kind of a well-rounder and have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. Whew, okay, enough about me, let's get to the fun stuff. So the theme for today's topic was, you know, how is China different today than maybe the first time you came to China five, 10 years ago? How are strategies that worked before not working now? What are some of the new strategies for the current China? And first off, I'd like to talk about the new normal. What I mean by this is 10, 15 years ago, I would often you know, have a couple beers with my Chinese suppliers in places like Zhejiang and Dongguan. And you know, after a few beers, I might ask them, well, you know, Mr. Wang, what's your real goal? Why are you in manufacturing? And quite often, the answer was shocking. They would tell me, Mike, we're in manufacturing for easy money, but we want to get into property business. We want to invest. We want to go to New Zealand. You know, buy property, we want to get out of manufacturing. So it's very awkward for suppliers to tell me that they're really in manufacturing just for the short term. Total change happened after the global financial crisis. Now when I meet manufacturers, they're under intense competition. Those sloppy manufacturers that really didn't care about manufacturing, luckily they're gone. You know, they didn't survive. So now when I visit with Chinese manufacturers, for the most part, I hear things like, yes, we want to develop our own brands. We want to be competitive on a global stage. We want to have our own technology. You know, we want to lead the marketplace. That's what I want to hear. So that's a positive change. The other really great thing is that, you know, 17 years ago, China joined the World Trade Organization. That means they're committed, in theory, to a level playing field for intellectual property, rule of law. And I don't, so things have changed a lot. You know, a contract really means something nowadays. 10, to 10, 15 years ago, if we had this talk, people in the audience would say, I don't need a contract because it's not worth the paper that it's written on. I'll never get a fair shake in a Chinese court of law. Totally different. I'm here to tell you as a foreigner, I've won against court cases, I've won court cases against Chinese entities. Um, I felt I had a very fair, playing field. Of course, I use Chinese contra language contracts and Chinese jurisdiction and Chinese lawyers. But if you play by the rules, you can get a, a level playing field. So don't let tell anybody tell you that China is not rule-based or that it's not fair to foreigners. Um, also, I want to point out that, you know, why would China now suddenly care about intellectual or property rights after 20 years of not caring? The real reason is walking around the startup zone, you can see that Chinese companies finally have technology that they've developed. So naturally, Beijing is going to start enforcing property rights. So it's not surprising that, that China is finally getting serious about contracts and intellectual property. OK, um, back in the day, you would always hear guanxi relationships, that you got to know somebody. you got to have a special relationship. And the old model was, if I invest a lot of time in building a friendship with the factory owner, you know, Mr. Wang would never do me wrong. He won't break the contract because we're friends. That's kind of dangerous, and now you're crazy if you rely too much on Guanxi. Nowadays, if a supplier comes to me and says, Mike, I'm gonna give you a special price because my cousin works, at the, uh, is, works in an import-export company and we're friends with the governor's sister and she can get us a lower duty rate and we can get your raw materials at cheaper. You know, that kind of stuff happened in the 80s and 90s and beginning of the century, if that happens now, your supplier's saying, I've got a special relationship somewhere in China, run away, because that's a danger now that the central government is cracking down on corruption and such. Also, if that connection changes, you're left, you don't have a legal document that says you have lower duty rates, or so you have no, um, no protection, it's not sustainable. So when people try to sell you on their contacts and guanxi and relationship, I just kinda, I move on. All right, uh, balanced economy. 
back in the day when I was just starting my business 20 years ago, I'm in my late 20s and I would show up at a factory and the fact that I was American and just put on a cheap suit and, and sat down, they would assume that I'm a big powerful buyer because I'm from America. You know, it, it's changed a lot. Now, there are so many suppliers, I'm sorry, so many customers knocking on the doors of the suppliers that we as buyers have to explain to the factory why we're worth doing business with, why I'll be a good customer for you, Mr. Supplier. So the, the situation has totally changed. Back then it was the factories were fighting for our business, now as customers we have to fight to do business with the quality factories. Totally, totally a game changer. One of the reasons is that uh, China is rebalancing its economy. In the past it was almost all export driven, now the domestic economy is substantial and um, you know, when you go to a supplier and you talk about your order for New Zealand for 200,000 units, you know, in China the domestic economy might demand 2 million units. So it's really tough to get the factory's attention now because you're not only competing against other importers overseas but also the domestic market. All right, now finally the, the other thing that has changed is you've heard about this uh, one belt, road, one road and opening up the west. The interior of China is poor compared to the coastal areas. You all know this. And if you get on a train and you go eight hours in that direction, it's like going back 15, 20 years in time. But the Chinese government is incentivizing factories to move to those locations to bring up the quality of life and the wealth of the, the population that still lives in those rural areas. So what's happening is, happening is that these factories that you've dealt with along the coast in places like Fujian and Zhejiang and Guangdong province, now they move up and they go to places you've never heard of like Chongqing and Hunan and Anhui. And uh, the sad part is that when you pick up and move a factory, things probably will change. Managers won't move, new staff need to be trained, new suppliers need to be developed in the supply chain. So all of those factories that I spent 10 years dialing things in and getting a great quality product, when they move, I like have to start over again with all the headaches that I dealt with in terms of quality control 20 years ago. So yeah, I get a better price, but a lot more headaches. So this opening of the West uh, is definitely a challenge in modern China 2017. Okay, I was asked to do a couple minutes on, on scams, and I want to clarify that you know, most suppliers that you meet, actually at a trade show like this, the suppliers have paid a lot of money for a booth, They've been in the Global Net Sources Network for a while. They've been verified to some different degree. So the scam artists aren't the ones that exhibit here. You go on Google and type in, I want to buy batteries or electronics or fashion, and you just pick the first company you see, you may be scammed. So know that a scam, there's kind of two types of scams. Sometimes I'll get the email or the phone call, Mike, I've been scammed by this supplier. And I ask some questions. Did you verify them? Did you have a contract? You know, it's not a scam if you make mistakes as a buyer, you know, simple things like not doing due diligence, not using a contract. So often it's not about a scam, it's just about the two sides being inexperienced at how to do safe business. So today I'm gonna to give you some tips on how to avoid the, the occasional scam that's out there, as well as how to manage a vendor so that it doesn't become a bad vendor. Um, first off, you hear this term, e-buyer and that is the false concept that you can sit home in your country and do business with a Chinese factory without ever meeting them in person. Maybe if your orders are small but if you start to get any customization or large orders you know, it's really hard to to just buy online wholesale without meeting people you're, and you're, you're just a number you're not a person so there's a highly higher likelihood that that supplier is not going to treat you right. If you're dealing in small orders, you know, there's a higher likelihood you're gonna have problems or scams, sadly. This is a, a really dangerous area. If you're dealing in product that is high value, small size, there is a disproportionate number of scam artists targeting you. For example, SD cards. They're very expensive, they're very small. Why do the scam artists love that? Because almost all the orders ship FedEx, Express, and they leave the porous ports of China all those FedEx packages are not opened. The Customs Bureau does not look in to see if the declaration on the FedEx pack matches what's inside. When you send a container load of something, or even a less than container load, you know, bulk freight, 
it, there's a higher likelihood that someone at the Customs Bureau is going to look at it. Um, it's less likely that you're going to get a box of rocks, figuratively and literally. So when you buy something that is small and high value, it's easier for the scam artist to get it out of the country and give you the perception that they've shipped you something. Uh, when it arrives and after you've paid, you might be surprised. So just be careful if you're dealing with expensive things that are small and lightweight. Um, it's not so much this audience because you're more professional than perhaps your counterparts back, count, counterparties back home, but you know, people still think that they can go to China and buy famous brand names out the factory back door. And it just doesn't happen because made in China does not mean available in China. I, I can count on the number, you know, how many times just in the last year have I had silly buyers contact me and say, Mike, I think I found a supplier in China and he's got a cousin that works at the Apple Foxconn factory and I can get some tablets out the back door. The same people that make the, the Apple products. It doesn't happen, doesn't work. It's a scam 99.9% .9 of the time. You know, the companies like Apple and Samsung and the famous brands Gucci, they hold their suppliers, you know, really tightly. They know the raw material coming in, they know the finished product coming out. So you're wasting your money if you think you can buy a, a famous brand factory direct um, and have it to be real. Also, made in China doesn't mean cheaper in China. Um, when like new Apple products come out, some of my neighbors, my Chinese neighbors in Shenzhen that have passports, you know, they'll go shopping in Dubai or Singapore or new, even New York because the product is less expensive at Best Buy Perry, new, I'm sorry, Best Buy Buffalo, New York than in China because the taxation structure is different. So um, a, an electronics product, for example, or even finished goods, and whether it's a tent, uh, you know, or uh, a clothing or electronics, the retail price of the product might be more expensive in China than back home. So when someone says, yeah, we can, you know, we're going to get it cheaper in China because everything's cheaper, that's not true. Some things at the wholesale and retail level, especially if it's a volume thing, are cheaper back home. Now, you're not going factory direct in those sense. When you do go factory direct, yes, if you have volume, you should start to ex expect some, some discounts. But when someone says, we're a wholesaler in China and we've got Sony cameras and, and, C and uh, Apple products and we deal in the wholesale market in China, we're gonna give you a big discount. It's gonna be 20% less than you can ever get it back home. Almost always a fake. Most importantly, remember there's no safety net in China. Um, you know, okay, so you get scammed or you have a bad, a bad experience with a supplier. As an American, you might say, I'm going to report that bad supplier to the Chinese Better Business Bureau. Just for shits and giggles, go ahead and type on Google, Beijing Better Business Bureau. <laughs> There's no Better Business Bureau in, in all of China. Um, so it's not like you can really easily attack the supplier's reputation and get them to give your money back. So you know, you're really on your own. It's up to the buyer to make sure that they're sourcing safe. So I see no one has stood up and left and run away saying China's too scared. scary, that's a good thing, and I'm going to give you some tips to protect yourself. Okay, first off, it's really easy to avoid scams, and it's fairly easy to avoid letting good suppliers become bad suppliers. Let me explain how. First is, if you're walking around the trade show and you only focus on price, 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 you get what you pay for at the end of the day, often the suppliers will adjust their pricing points based on, I'm sorry, will adjust their quality based on your pricing points. So, you know, don't focus on price, price, price too much. Um, don't gamble. I cannot tell you how many times in the last week I've met people, especially if they're, they're just getting started and they've created a, a um, you know, they want to sell on Amazon and they got a little online store and they say to me, Mike, you know, I don't have $300 to pay for a, a factory audit and I can't hire a sourcing agency and you know, I'm only going to fly over to China one time for one week, and I don't have time to go across the border in China to visit the factory, so I'm just going to take a gamble. Now, if you fit that description, I would encourage you to get the free boat to Macau and go gamble there because you'll have a higher rate of return than if you're just kind of gambling with online suppliers in China. So go to Macau. It's a better bet. I don't know why everybody doesn't do this. Ask for references. If you're dealing with a supplier, they appear legit, why not ask for a couple references? Probably they will say this, oh, we can't tell you for security reasons our customers. Fair enough, I'm not asking for your whole list of clients, just give me one or two happy customers that you're friendly with. 
If a supplier can't give you that, run away. Um, and I've called, and I've followed up on those references, and occasionally out, the reference will tell me, Mike, do not do business with this company. So uh, you can learn a lot of information. I highlighted it, I put it in bold because it's so important. Who are you paying? Many people um, will spend the hard work to find a supplier, and then that it's time to place the purchase order and send money, and the supplier says, okay, you've audited our factory, you like our pricing, send money to this account in, bank in, uh, in Hong Kong. Or can you just send the money to our CFO's personal account? Because it, you know, it's sending the money to our, pri our corporate account, we have to jump through a lot of hoops with, with uh, bank transfers and currency, and they give a, a number of reasons why they want you to send money to somewhere other than their corporate account at the factory. Often they're not trying to cheat you, but what happens later is, say that you need to take that company to court or that they sent you some junk and now you want to negotiate a settlement. What will happen is the supplier in China will say, yeah, we received a purchase order and we shipped some goods, but looking at our corporate account, we don't have any record of money coming from you. And you will say, oh, you told me to pay this account in Hong Kong. Okay, so you go grab the Hong Kong company and the Hong Kong company will say, oh, the darndest thing happened. We don't have a, a contract or we don't know this American company, but we did receive $20,000 in our account last year and we spent it. You know, good luck connecting the dots unless you've put it in the contract already. So the best way to avoid scams is to make sure that the person that you're paying, their name in Chinese, not the pinyin, not the English name, you know, like happy, happy China factory, you know, kaixin zhongguo gongyinshang. And the, the, the translation, the kaixin means happy, but the only the, you could translate the pinyin of ka, kaixin many different characters. But there's only one official name for the Chinese company, and that's the Chinese characters, not happy. You know, that's not their registered name, and, and even not kaixin in pinyin. So you gotta make sure that the, the name on the contract, the name on the supplier's wall, and the name on the bank account are the same, ideally in Chinese. You do that and you're gonna avoid almost 100% of the scam artists. Okay, now if you wanna find great suppliers, obviously you go to globalsources.com. You wanna find the worst scam artists and bad suppliers out there, <laughs> check out supplierblacklist.com. It's a place where buyers like us, when we've been abused by suppliers, we uh, blacklist the, the, uh, the supplier. So, I read this every morning because I love to see someone else losing more money than I have and I feel good that maybe I'm not the only idiot out there. So I, I read this blog every morning and, and uh, it wakes me up to see that people are losing much more money than me. Okay, all kidding aside, you really need to verify the verifications. I know it sounds crazy. You ask a supplier, show me your ISO certification. Show me that you're doing business with Walmart. You said you are, show me the Walmart audit. Those documents can easily be photoshopped. Luckily, at the bottom of every certificate, every verification will say the auditor's name or where to follow up on a number to verify it's real. It takes you 10 minutes to contact the organization, do it. So verify the verifications. As I mentioned before, you know, don't run away. Think you're smart enough not to do this e-sourcing. You're here at the trade show, you're meeting sellers in person. Take it to the next step. Go visit their factory across the border. If you're thinking, I've, I've flown into China, to, to Hong Kong, I only have three days. What does it cost to extend your ticket a couple more days? Get a few more hotel, hotels in China. You know, go visit these factories. That's probably the single most important thing that, that you can do. All right, good, I've got some more time. Okay. I was asked to talk about negotiation. And if you've done your homework at the trade show and you've got a good idea of what the going prices are for, negotiation's really easy. You know, there is this misperception that you have to understand Chinese culture and the nuances of the meeting and that, that it's, uh, you know, it's like a battle of whoever is the better negotiator is gonna get the better deal. In my experience, it hasn't worked out like that at all. And uh, I hate to say it, but my Chinese father-in-law always tells me, oh Mike, China has 5,000 years of continuous history. America's got a couple hundred. It's not like you're gonna walk in here and out-negotiate us. We've been doing business for so long. And, Hate to say it, but my father-in-law is kind of right. So I don't even try to out-negotiate my Chinese counterparties. I simply out-research them. What I mean is, after the trade show, I'll know what the given price is for a widget. 
I'll go and visit the factory that I think has the quality and um, you know, the, the reputation, some, somebody that I want to do business with. And my negotiation always goes like this. Mr. Lee, it's a pleasure to visit with you. We met at the trade show. I've toured your factory. Um, I like that you're ISO certified. Your staff are courteous. Your product's great. However, per my standard operating procedures, I'm required to get four quotations. And my research has shown that you're 7.2% higher than your competitor in Zhejiang province who has similar quality, similar factory, perhaps a little bit better in this area. However, if you give me a 3% discount over the quote that you gave me, I'd like to do business with you. Now, the supplier instantly knows that I've done my homework and I know what the rates are. I have a, it's take it or leave it almost. And every time the supplier takes it. If you think that you're playing poker and you go in there and you say, Mr. Lee, your price is too expensive. Give me 12% discount and we do business. Now Mr. Lee knows that you didn't do your homework because no one in China is producing it at 12% off. So you can't really fake this stuff. You just need to do a little bit of homework and then it, it pays dividends over and over. So that's like how to negotiate. But let me tell you some of the fun stuff that might happen while you're negotiating. Um, everybody has been to the factory in China or have you been you know, taken out for a big meal and drinks and to talk about the factory and you know, see the town? Has everyone like visited factories and such? All right, for some of you that haven't, this is what you'll experience. And for those that have been there, tell me if it's the truth or not. So often what happens is uh, a couple, thing, couple mistakes are made. First, the foreign buyer is so excited to be at the factory that he communicates only with the person that speaks English, which is usually the junior sales assistant just out of college. Maybe she was an exchange student in Canada, speaks English. And so the foreign buyer comes over and just spends all this time you know, going out for tea and singing karaoke with this uh, staff at a low position in the company. That staff member changes, and now the relationship with the factory is lost because you just wasted your time building a relationship with a person who maybe isn't stable. So what I like to encourage is to build a relationship. First, find out who are the decision makers in the factory. Who owns it? Who is the QC director? Who is the sales supervisor? Who is the account manager that you're going to talk to after your purchase has been made? Is it that sales girl? Is it someone else? So after you find out who the important people are and you're around a table, you use that translator as uh, your voice, but you don't give them too much power. What I mean is, if you're sitting across the table from the QC director and you want to build a relationship with that person and you have your translator on the left, you don't like talk to her for 15 minutes and then say, oh, you know, tell Mr. Mr. Zhang what I said. The much better way, and you don't have to speak Chinese to do this, is look Mr. Zhang in the eye across the table, acknowledge his presence, say his role is so important, and then say just a couple sentences at a time. Translator, please explain to Mr. Zhang this, that, and the other. Let him know that his factory has excellent quality. I would like to have his comments. And it, it might take a little bit longer, but that way you're building the relationship with that person, you're giving them a lot of face, and when that sales girl moves on to a different job, Mr. Zhang is going to remember you. Other point, important point, 99% of buyers let the seller do the, the interpretation. I think that's dangerous. When I go into a factory, I don't tell them I speak Chinese. I just sit there and glean information. The same is true when you have an interpreter that's offered, OK, the factory provides the interpreter. You go visit the factory, and you ask a question like, what is the lead time on this new product? The Chinese team talks amongst theirself. The engineer says, we've never dealt with those raw materials. How in the world can we give a forecast for something we don't understand? The, the, um, the finance guy at the factory internally says, well, as long as we get a big enough deposit up front, you know, just tell them whatever they need so we can get some money. The salesperson says, well, at the Global Sources Trade Show, our competitors are all quoting 20 days lead time. What does the interpreter say? 20 day lead time, Mr. Bellamy. Now, if that interpreter worked for you, they're kind of listening to what's going on. And that reminds me, you know, use the trick of a, a foreign non-Chinese face that speaks Chinese can be very powerful. For example, at some of our meetings, when we wait for the critical time in the negotiation, I'll have a signal where my translator leaves the room to go check her email or use the restroom, and I just sit there, and sometimes I hear some crazy stuff. Like, 
yeah, Americans, they've got a lot of money. Let's add 10% more than we usually do, and you know, all sorts of stuff. And then I start speaking in Chinese, and they're like, oh. And, but, you know, so don't let that happen to you in reverse. Don't assume that just because the Chinese staff aren't communicating to you in spoken English that they don't understand every word you're saying. There are so many Chinese factory employees that have great ears but maybe are a little bit embarrassed to open their mouth. Um, my favorite story is this big American company came over to Shanghai and they got into the, the car, picked up at the airport, the Chinese staff come to the airport, and usually it's a driver in a minivan, and it's, uh, you know, Mr. Smith, car this way. No, no speaking English, car, car. Okay, you get in the car, and Mr. Smith and his colleagues babble on for hours on the four-hour ride to the factory about um, you know, their, their strategy. And then they get to the factory, start the negotiation. It's like the Chinese side knew what they were talking about. In this case, the uh, factory owner's son was educated in Oxford. <laughs> But the dad told him to drive the car from the airport to the factory, and he just sat there listening the whole time. So be careful with, always assume the microphone's always on. I swear, you, swear to you, I've been in meetings, large orders, you know, placing like a million dollars of auto parts. I found a live microphone under the table one time where we were supposed to, the foreigners were supposed to be discussing uh, policy before the negotiation, I found hidden video cameras. I mean, it costs next to nothing to get a video camera nowadays and hide it somewhere. So assume the microphone is always on. Um, okay, so you know, let's wrap it up. We only have about five minutes. Uh, I talked a lot about negotiation. I didn't have a chance to cover quality control or intellectual property, but the good news is I have so many of these videos um, online. You can check out the China Sourcing Academy. We have, like, I think there's a crash course that's uh, free of charge that you can, you can check out. Um, also, before we move to our five minutes of question and answer, I'd like to do two things. I'll leave you with some resources, but also if you take away just one thing, please, please, please make sure that the name on your contract matches the name on the factory door, ma matches the name on the bank account where you're sending money. You do that one thing, you've protected yourself from 99% of the scams. Okay, some resources. My company, Passage Maker at the top, the law firm associated with. Also, I, I'm often asked, hey Mike, can you, introduce, you know, can you introduce a logistics company? Can you introduce an inspection company? Can you introduce a sourcing agent? So I told some of the people that have done a good job for me to come over to my booth and hang out. So there's Brian right there as a, a sourcing agent that I've done business with and recommend. And Neil is my partner in the China Sourcing Academy. And they're hanging out over at booth um, 11L34. I'll be there too during the show, so happy to visit. Supplier blacklist in the Academy. And if you really haven't had enough of me today, you can go to YouTube and type Mike Bellamy and you'll find some famous American football players. If you type Mike Bellamy China, you'll find my ugly mug and a bunch of videos on my YouTube channel. So type Mike Bellamy China and uh, if you wanna see my YouTube channel. Whew, that was a lot to fit into 32 minutes, but I would be happy to answer any questions you have and we have a microphone that can come, come around. Th thank you for your attendance today. Thank you, Mike. Great stories my and pleasure. sharing. <laughs> All right, any questions for Mike? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Well, in about 15 years I'm buying from China, mm -hmm. I always had to pay to Hong Kong bank account. It was always an Hong Kong company. Yeah. And maybe I've been scammed a couple of times, but I don't see how I can, I, how I can use it, how I can use this advice. Okay. There's no manufacturing in Hong Kong. So you have, maybe if you're dealing with a large, reputable Hong Kong trading company with real assets, real employees here, something goes wrong, your lawyers in Hong Kong have some teeth, that they, there's some meat that they can dig into. If you're dealing with a Hong Kong company that used to have a trading office here, but now they move that trading office to Shenzhen and they own a factory in Shenzhen, God forbid if there's a large lawsuit, they're gonna close the doors on the Hong Kong company and you'll never get, get your money. Now, what I like to do is I put my jurisdiction in the contract and sign the contract with the entity that has the assets, the factory. And sometimes the factory will say, well, you need to send the money to our headquarters in Hong Kong. Okay, but let's put in the contract that me, I'm signing this contract with a Chinese factory and I'm sending money to account number ABC, HSBC, number so-and-so, 
And if, God forbid, anything goes wrong, the Chinese company, the factory, is taking liability for the, or responsibility for that Hong Kong account number. So it's OK to send money to Hong Kong, but if the seller has no real assets here, it's in your best interest to link it to somewhere that, that has a little bit more meat for your lawyers to go after if needed. So just add to the contract. Uh, that's, you know, especially if you're, the Hong Kong trading company doesn't want to tell you too much information about the factory, but somehow you have no, to link the two. It's not a Hong Kong trading company. It's the Chinese company that yeah. usually has an Hong Kong company as well. Yeah. Very oh. dangerous. You know, just... Well, I had yeah. a problem in 15 years, yeah. except a couple of times, but the reason was not that one. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Hi, Mike. Is it working? Hi. Hi, I'm Ethan, and uh, I recently just launched my own venture in Switzerland. Yes. And uh, I have like a pain point, which is that whenever I visit a factory, they expect me to speak Chinese, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm not Chinese, <laughs> yeah. right? And then it's really awkward, because I always go with translator, and then so, so it's really, uh, so the awkward moment is the manufacturer, they thought I was playing a trick, yeah. you know, but actually I'm really, I don't know how yeah. to speak Chinese. But okay, so that's not a question. So <laughs> the question is, um, so there's a lot of manufacturers, as you mentioned, as a new trend, uh, they try to differentiate themselves by offering more services. Mm -hmm. For uh, the one service is the R&D. Yeah. And then so uh, for, to your experience, like how you, did you uh, encounter different manufacturers that have their own uh, in-house R&D yeah. and also the R&D that they all source it? So what's the differences? Between? Sure, the key thing is to, before you send any money, before you open any tooling, before you go and set up a distribution chain in Switzerland, you gotta be really clear with the supplier who owns the technology that's being co-developed, who owns the brand. Because you might assume, oh, it's my idea, I'm from Switzerland, it's my market, the supplier is doing this for me. And often the supplier, maybe they wanna help you in the beginning, but later something goes wrong. You, don't, you promise them a million units and you only, uh, you only purchased half that amount. And so they're going to say, we did all the work on creating the R&D. We set up the, the, the CAD files. We opened the tooling. And they're going to feel that they're ethically and morally out. You know, it's, it's their right to make some money on it. So I like to have two contracts, one for the technology, one for the purchase order, especially if it's anything customization. And a really dangerous thing to do is to go to a supplier and say, OK, You've got the brand, Mr. Supplier. You've got the R&D. I will be your exclusive partner in Switzerland. I guarantee Chinese factories love to hear that because you do all the hard work to open the market, and it's so easy to cut you out of the deal later. You know, they give the technology to their cousin's factory. How in the world are you going to know that the factory gave the technology, you know, end run? So it's, it's really dangerous to, to represent a factory and then, you know, um, get compensation when the factory feels that you've you haven't worked hard enough to get that million dollar paycheck. So there are ways with contracts, ways with you owning the brand, and registering that brand in Switzerland. Just you know, be aware of it and uh, protect yourself from the beginning. Uh, hi, uh, if I sign agreements with a Chinese company, so the contract be based uh, on laws in China, Great. Or Hong Kong, a neutral place like Hong Kong or Singapore? I love this question because I made the mistake many times. When I was young and just getting started, you know, I'm a New York, U.S. passport holder, so I would go to my New York attorney and say, hey, where should I put the jurisdiction? They always told me New York State because we can't trust the Chinese court of law. Really what they meant is they wanted me to pay them $500 an hour to fight a court case that can never be won. What I mean is even if you win in the U.S., you can't take that... Um, court declaration to China and say pay up. Two different systems. So all of my contracts are bilingual contracts where I've got a great lawyer, I'd be happy to introduce them to anybody here. So my contracts are pretty simple, straightforward. Chinese is the language, uh, China is the jurisdiction, Chinese is the language, because you can't go to a Chinese court. Let me step back. An English language contract is legally binding in China. That's true. But if it ever goes to court, the judge will say, we need an official translation. And you will end up fighting with the opposing side to, to how is each word in that English contract translated, and it will be used as a stall tactic so that you'll never actually get to the, the court. It's much better to have your language bilingual. And uh, the, I put the jurisdiction in China every time, with one exception. 
if I'm dealing with a state-owned enterprise in a very small town, and there's a high likelihood that the mayor's cousin might be the judge in that small town. So you know, I, I go ahead and put it at the nearest provincial capital. Um, and as I may have mentioned before, you know, I've, I've got 11 wins in the Chinese court of law against Chinese entities. So a foreigner can, can get a good break. Uh, before I end, I just want to make you know, really clear that I'm not here to say that Chinese companies are trying to cheat you. That it, I have great relationships. Some of my suppliers, like family, are children or pen pals. I invite them to visit my house. So I'm not here to say that suppliers are bad, especially ones at a trade show like this. They're, they're a cut above. But you, know, you, you have to assume the worst and protect yourself. So contracts are so important. OK, do we have time for any more questions? I think there's one in the back. Yeah. One last question. Hi. Um, we've been coming to China. We're from, I'm from Chile, um, like seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. We go to, we visit the factories. They're usually very serious, big factories. Yes. Um, they, they work with um, big brands and everything. We, we buy samples. We buy, we take the products and test them. When the product is finished, do you still recommend to do inspection? Yeah, a, a third-party inspection is it's money well spent. You know, it only costs like a professional one can be done for two hundred and ninety-eight dollars. Now, he, he, if if you're thinking, oh, well, that's going to be expensive. Here's a trick: tell your supplier that you will pay for the inspection if it passes, so it doesn't cost them any money. But they're going to pay for the inspection if it fails. And they have to keep paying for the reinspections, which can be three or four if they're reworking. What supplier that believes in their quality won't agree to that? So that's the way that I kind of sp spread the, the, the risk and reward over the buyer and seller. Hey, I'll, yeah, I'll pay for the inspection. It'll be an independent inspector that I pay. And uh, it's, not, it's on me if you get it right. And um, you know, that's incentive for the supplier to, to ship quality product on time at the agreed price. OK. Thank you so much, Mike. My pleasure. Let's give it a round of applause, everyone. Thank you.